Is it on 1020? Yeah, oh. I think 1020. So we have oh. All right. Okay, so <laughs> next talk is by Sam Hopkins. We'll talk about mean estimation. Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, and thanks very much to the organizers for their efforts. So this talk um, is going to be about a very simple problem. How to estimate the mean of a random vector. So uh, the problem is the following. Uh, you get to see n samples, um, you know, x1 up to xn. They're d-dimensional, and they're iid copies of some unknown random variable x. And your goal is just to estimate the mean of x uh, based on these samples. Now, of course, probably everybody's thinking, like, why don't you just use the empirical mean and move on with your life? And indeed, in many situations, the empirical mean is a good estimator of the population mean. Um, but, but the best estimator to use depends on what you want out of your estimator. So let's review the most classical picture. Um, maybe the, the, the first thing you might want is that your estimator have small mean squared error. This expectation will always be over all the samples unless I say otherwise. Um, so maybe you would like your estimator to have small mean squared error. And then if you assume pretty mild assumption that the variance of x exists, uh, the mean squared error is minimized among all possible estimators by the empirical mean, so that's a good choice. Um, and in the classical picture, we even can say something about how the, uh, uh, under this weak assumption, we can say something about how the empirical mean fluctuates about the population mean, at least in the asymptotic sense. If we know that the number of samples goes to infinity, then central limit theorems say that the distribution of mu bar, the empirical mean, becomes Gaussian. In this talk, we're going to aim for uh, a more fine-grained picture in two ways. Um, one is that we will ask for confidence intervals. We want estimators for which we can prove um, radii of, bounds on radii of confidence intervals. And we're interested in non-asymptotic bounds. Okay. So um, more precisely, for every, what we would like is that for every number of samples and every desired confidence delta, we would like to give an estimator mu hat of the mean such that we can prove a concentration inequality like this, a, devi a deviation bound on the distance of mu hat to mu, uh, with the smallest possible r delta. And r delta here plays the role of the radius of a delta confidence interval, but in high dimensions. Uh, so here's the picture in case you've never seen a confidence interval before. You know, here's, here's the population mean of some data. Here's my estimator. And I've won the game in this case because I decided r delta was this radius, radius ball. OK, and of course, uh, confidence intervals have also been studied for a long time. So what can there possibly be new to say? Um, it turns out that confidence intervals and the empirical mean don't play so well together when the underlying distribution, this random variable x, has a heavy tail. And today's talk will be all about heavy tail distributions x, and that's why this, this talk uh, makes sense in a robustness workshop. We're going to ask for estimators for which we can prove the kind of confidence interval bounds on the previous slide under the mildest possible assumptions on x that we can get away with. And the assumption for the rest of the talk is just that x has two finite moments. OK, so that's what I'll mean by heavy tails for this talk. And uh, just to get you in the, in the mindset, here are some distributions that you might keep in mind. So in blue, we have a standard Gaussian. That does not have a heavy tail. All of its moments exist. In green is another Gaussian. It has higher variance. That doesn't make it have a heavy tail. But I'm thinking of this maybe modeling a data set that has some kind of corruptions in it. And you could think of corruptions, whether adversarial or you know, just introduced by some nasty, noisy process, uh, as, as introducing heavy tails into your, into your data set. And then in orange is um, the, the canonical heavy tail distribution, the Pareto distribution, or power law. And you can see it's outgrowing Gaussians very quickly. Um, OK, so I, I made this claim, uh, this so far qualitative claim, that uh, the empirical mean has poor confidence intervals, poor means too large, in heavy tailed situations. So let me try to make that a little bit more precise. You know, the intuition here is going to be that if you have a bunch of samples from a heavy tailed distribution and you're interested in what happens with probability 1 minus delta, if you want something to happen with probability 1 minus delta, you cannot rule out that the list of samples has some egregious outliers, some vectors of, say, very large norm. They're very far from the mean. Um, and these vectors will really destroy the empirical mean, because the empirical mean is quite sensitive to such outliers. So let's, I know this is familiar ground, but let's just review what's going on. So uh, to state some quantitative bounds on confidence intervals achieved by the empirical mean, uh, here are some of the, just the main players that will appear in them. Uh, sigma is always the covariance of x for at least the first half of this talk. Um, and the two key quantities are the trace of sigma which is the expected square distance from a single sample x to mu. Think of this as being a dimension-dependent quantity. 
Okay, so if the data, if x is isotropic, which is a good setting to keep in mind, then this is like d, the ambient dimension. And here, uh, the, the norm of sigma will I'll always mean the spectral norm, or the maximum eigenvalue. So just to ground ourselves, let's recall what would, what would be the radius of a delta confidence interval if the underlying distribution x were Gaussian. Okay, This is like the best possible situation. And here, the empirical mean is an excellent estimator of the mean. So this is, this is our um, kind of reference point. And here, it turns out, you can, you can this is a pretty easy exercise. You can see that the radius of a delta confidence interval has the following form. It has an expectation term and a deviation term. So notice that the dependence on delta lives only in one of the terms. And the qualitative features, the important qualitative features of this are the following. One, okay, it has a 1 over square root n convergence rate. Not too surprising. Um, second, because x in this uh, equation is Gaussian, the dependence on the tail probability is logarithmic in 1 over delta. Um, and the amount you pay in the tail is dimension independent. It multiplies only the top eigenvalue of the covariance instead of the trace of the covariance. And that's to contrast the situation with the empirical mean uh, in a heavy-tailed situation, so under the assumption of only two finite moments of x. If x has only two finite moments, the best you can hope to do to bound the confidence intervals of the empirical mean is Chebyshev's inequality, and you'll get a, 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 a radius like this. So again, it has the 1 over root n rate, not too surprising, but it's much worse in its dependence on delta. You know, the dependence, first of all, became polynomial in 1 over delta instead of log 1 over delta. And um, 1 over delta multiplies a dimension-dependent quantity, trace of sigma. So this leads to the question, um, is there an estimator of the mean whose confidence intervals are as small as those achieved by the empirical mean in the Gaussian setting, but under only the assumption that x has two finite moments? So is there an estimator of the mean which is that robust? Uh, the answer to this, not due to me, uh, appeared after, this is actually the culmination of a series of papers by, by, by a lot of folks, um, appeared in a paper by Lugosi and Mendelssohn earlier this year. Um, unfortunately, the estimator proposed in their paper, uh, the, the best algorithm we know to compute it, by, and where by best I mean with respect to running time, uh, is really slow. It seems to take exponential time in the ambient dimension. Uh, so this is bad news in a high dimensional setting. So the main result of the work I'm talking about answers the following question. Is there a polynomial time computable estimator whose confidence interval radii match those of the empirical mean from the Gaussian setting, even when the underlying distribution has only two finite moments? And the answer to this is yes, according to this paper. Uh, actually, I should say in some late breaking news, I received an email last night with some uh, some small technical uh, difficulty in a part of the proof that should follow from standard machinery that, uh, that Jerry and Adam talked about on Monday. So take that for what it is. I just haven't had time to address that in the archive version yet. But anyway, uh, that will be the main theorem in this work. So uh, are there questions thus far? You're nodding like maybe you have a question, but maybe not. OK. So the two moments are mean and variance? Mean and variance. That's it. Yep. Um, so your goal is to get exactly the subconscious <clears throat> tail? Yeah, I'm actually going to pay a constant factor in the, in the radius. But the two terms are? The two terms will be separated, but, e but both will be multiplied by some large constant. Yeah. And I don't know what the right con I mean, I know what the constants are you get for this algorithm, but I don't know. They're certainly not the tightest constants you could hope for. Um, OK, so, so let me describe a little bit of prior work. Um, obviously, estimating the mean has a long history, so we can't be totally comprehensive here. Uh, as before, we were talking about estimating the mean of a distribution whose covariance is uh, sigma. You get n samples. You want confidence 1 minus delta. And there are three kinds of confidence interval radii which are going to appear. I'm going to call a good, a good radius is this, this thing we saw from the Gaussian setting. So it has the separate has the dimension independent tail with logarithmic dependence on delta. There's, there are going to be tail bounds of this form. Um, there's, I'm going to call them OK. They have the sub-Gaussian tail, log 1 over delta, but the rate of that sub-Gaussian tail depends on the dimension. It multiplies trace of sigma. Um, and then a bad, a bad confidence interval radius is what you would get out of the empirical mean in a heavy-tailed situation. So. Here's, here's just a few things to compare to. 
Um, as we discussed, you have, there's the empirical mean, which of course is polynomial time computable in any dimension, but its confidence interval radii are not so good. It turns out that in uh, one dimension, there are a lot of estimators that we know that under the assumption of only two finite moments achieve good confidence interval radii and they're polynomial time computable. Um, about five years ago, some, some ideas were introduced uh, that allow you in high dimensions in polynomial time to get this kind of sub Gaussian tail, but with a dimension dependence in the, in the rate of tail decay. Um, and then this is this work by Lugosi and Mendelssohn from early this year that um, give a really slow exponential time algorithm, but it has exactly the properties that we want. It's got a good tail and it works in any dimension. And then the main theorem of this work is an algorithm I'm calling median SDP. Um, it works in any dimension. It has this good tail rate and it runs in polynomial time. Yeah. So what is the delta that you would be interested in practice? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. And actually, I was going to just, yeah. Go I was going to say something about this at the end of the talk. Um, it's not clear that you can distinguish, like, I don't know if you can distinguish these rates in practice, right? Because delta has to be, seems like it has to be really tiny. Also the first and the last. Statisticians <coughs> use 5%, right? so that's a factor 10. So, between one over square. That's, that's if you want to estimate, if you want to estimate one vector, right, then, then you would be losing a factor 10. If you want to simultaneously estimate many vectors and be, be able to pay for a union bound, uh, then, then you might want much higher confidence on a per vector on a per per vector basis, right? And you can imagine, you know, somehow it's not so hard to imagine situations where there are a lot of high dimensional vectors I'd like to estimate. So I at least want I would I would at least want to be able to think of delta as um, decaying with with d because I should think of estimating a number of vectors that's comparable to maybe the dimension that they live in. Uh, whether or not you should think of delta as decaying so fast that you can tell the difference between these rates, like is it exponentially small in D? Uh, maybe that's uh, more of a theoretical <laughs> concern in that, at that point. I'm not sure. Yeah? So geometric medium has a very attractive uh, time to compute. Yeah. What about your time? Slow. Polynomial time, but slow. Uh, like, and, and uh, yeah, input size to a, to a big constant uh, 10 at least, I don't know, something big. Um, I don't think that's inherent, by the way. The, the, one of the features, so this, is this, this algorithm is going to use this sum of squares method. Sum of squares method is really nice for giving clean and simple proofs uh, that polynomial time algorithms exist. But usually to obtain algorithms with really attractive running times, you need to do some additional work. You need to simplify the algorithm, maybe remove some of the sum of squares type machinery. So I haven't tried to do that. Uh, I think it should be possible, and I think it should be possible to achieve <coughs> even nearly linear running times, conceivably. Other questions? Yeah. So the empirical mean doesn't depend on delta. Do the rest of these estimators depend on delta? Yes, they do. Uh, maybe there are some here that don't. Maybe somebody more educated than me knows the answer. But, but these certainly depend on delta, and uh, as does uh, as just the median STP. And I think, I think it's known that to get this kind of rate, you need to depend on delta. You can't have, a, have an estimator which, that's not true? There's somebody shaking their, with a shaking head. There's work in statistics where you can use Huber loss and change parameter, and you'll get the same Gaussian rates for heavy tail distribution. Oh, OK. I didn't know that. So I should say, I'm, a, I'm not my, my, I'm a you know, computer scientist by training, so I'm sure many people are more familiar with the statistical literature, and I'll be very happy to my, hear. Um, my answer to my collection is similar to yours. I recall Gabor, like a few weeks ago, saying the exact same thing, that to get this behavior, you need your estimator to use delta in the input. So this is, this is a literature question, so let's, let's take it offline so we can move forward. Um, but the answer is yes. Uh, with the exception of the empirical mean, all of these things depend on delta. OK, so here's, here's the theorem. Um, for every number of samples, every ambient dimension, every desired confidence, there's an algorithm with this running time. Um, this, this hidden constant, as I said, is maybe like 10, um, which given n uh, samples from x produces an estimator such that this tail bound holds. So this is the Gaussian rate, and we're paying a constant in front of it. And as I said, I don't know what the optimal constants are. And I don't know whether the optimal constants information theoretically should be achievable in polynomial time or not. Open question. Uh, okay. The eh, sorry. The main innovation, technically, 
sorry. <coughs> Slides aren't lining up. There we go. The main innovation, technically, is a new SDP approach to computing a high dimensional median. This semi definite program is based on the sum of squares hierarchy that we heard something about on Monday. Uh, but I want to emphasize that familiarity with SOS is not a prerequisite for this talk. And by making some judicious simplifications later on, we're going to talk only about semi definite programming in its more basic forms uh, in the technical part of the talk. So you can stay awake. Um, questions about the theorem statement? Any more before we talk about how it works? OK. So here's the agenda for the second half of the talk. Um, I want to describe <coughs> what happens in the one-dimensional case. I want to describe this uh, an idea called the median of means estimator, which maybe some of you in the audience have seen, which is going to underlie the rest of the estimators described in the talk. And then I want to discuss how Lugosi and Mendelssohn generalized this median of means idea to high dimensions, and finally describe something about the, um, the SDP-based algorithm. OK. So let's talk about one-dimensional one dimensional mean estimation. Um, you get n iid copies of some random variable x. Its expectation is mu. This is now a number. And its variance is sigma squared. As we said, um, under only these assumptions, the empirical mean will achieve this kind of confidence interval radius. Uh, it'll be polynomial in 1 over delta. And I want to describe uh, an estimator which achieves a confidence interval radius like this. Um, so the 1 over delta became a log 1 over delta. And the cost is that some hidden constant got a bit bigger here. Actually, the hidden constant is probably 1 in the first thing. So here's the estimator in words. On pic in, it'll be uh, in pictures on the next slide. Take your samples, randomly partition them into k buckets. Uh, k, take k to be some constant times log 1 over delta. Step one, we want to get a 1 over root n convergence rate. And the way we're going to do this is just take the empirical mean of the samples in the buckets. Um, and in step two, uh, we're going to output any median of the bucketed means, median of means. So here's the estimator in pictures. Take a bunch of samples. Uh, here I put them into, I think, 10 buckets at random and plotted the means in the buckets. And then in green, you can see the median of those pink dots. That's your estimator. Why does it work? Why does it replace 1 over delta with a log 1 over delta? If you get nothing else out of the talk, remember this insight. The number of outliers in a list of heavy-tailed samples concentrates even when the sum of outliers, the sum of the outlier values, doesn't. Sum of outlier values is very nasty because it's you know a bunch of big numbers. But the number of outliers concentrates much better. So here's. Here's the formal <laughs> argument in one dimension. It's ultra simple. Remember, we took these bucketed averages. right? So we took our samples, we bucketed them, we took the means. And we can think of z1 up to zk, which are these bucketed averages, as independent draws from some other random variable whose mean is the thing we want to estimate and whose variance is a k over n factor smaller than the guy we started with. That's just because averaging reduces the variance. And there were n over k samples per bucket. And the first observation is that if at least, let's say, two-thirds of the zi's are not outliers in this sense, for some number r that I'm going to choose later, the distance from zi to mu is at most r, then the median is also close to r. Okay? And this is just because uh, you know, if you have a set of two-thirds of your samples, the median has to be like, either contained in that set or sandwiched between two points in that set. So if there aren't too many outliers, the median is good. So now we'd like to know. How, um, how small can I make r so that this thing happens with high probability? To get that to happen, I first need to get some kind of control on an individual zi. And the only hope that I have is to use Chebyshev's inequality, because all I know is about the uh, second moment of z. And Chebyshev says this, for any, radius, for any number r, the probability that zi deviates more than r from the mu is at most the variance over r squared, which is this number. And now what I'm going to do is choose r so that the probability that any individual zi is an outlier is like 0.01. Notice I don't need high probability bounds on any individual z. That would kill me because z has a heavy tail. But once I know that no zi is individually an outlier with more than 0.01 probability, I know that the probability that there are, say, more than k over 3 outliers is exponentially small in k. That's just a binomial tail bound. <coughs> and because I chose k to be log 1 over delta, uh, what I'll get is that 
with pro except with probability delta, this condition holds where r is chosen to make this 0.01. And the result is that with probability at least 1 minus delta, the median of z1 up to zk, these bucketed means, has distance at most uh, square root k sigma squared over n, which is um, square root sigma squared log 1 over delta over n to the mean. Questions about this? When do I go to? Uh, around 11. Okay. Oh, great. Let me double check. Sorry. That's cool. No, 11, 10. That's very good. Um, okay. <coughs> Questions about this in that case? Great. Um, so now what are we going to do to generalize this thing to higher dimensions? This was a one-dimensional picture, and we saw how to get 1 over delta to become log 1 over delta. Um, remember that now in high dimensions, our goal is an estimator with this kind of uh, confidence interval radius. We're going as before. Let's, let's, just, let's just try to do the simplest thing we can. So we're going to take our samples x1 to xn. We're going to put them in buckets as before. We're going to take the empirical means in the buckets. And we're going to think of these bucketed averages as themselves independent draws of some other random variable z whose mean is the guy we wanted to estimate. Now this is a d-dimensional vector, and whose covariance is reduced by a factor of k over n from the guy we started with. Now what could you do? The question we need to answer is, what kind of outlier events can we ensure hold uh, with, probability, with, with high probability in k? Remember, because I chose k to be log 1 over delta, this will get me like uh, 1 minus delta probability. And in the one-dimensional case, we were able to say that with high probability, at least two-thirds k of the z's are not outliers, where the definition of an outlier is distance more than a constant times the square root of the variance to mu. <coughs> if I try to do the same thing in high dimensions, I will get in trouble. I could say, let's, let's, let's just prove the same theorem, where I do Chebyshev as before to establish the meaning of an outlier, and I'll get the following kind of bound, kind of result. With high probability, at least two-thirds k of the z's have L2 distance, at most the square root of the thing that plays the role of the variance, so the variance of this distance, um, to the mean. And the problem is that uh, this distance, this, this expect, the variance of this distance is dimension dependent. This, is, this will be like the trace of the covariance of z, which will be like a k over n factor times the trace of the covariance of sigma. And uh, if you push this kind of idea through, if you try to say there are, mo there are say, you know, k over 3 of the z's which are outliers, I don't care about them, and then I'm going to do something simple with the remaining 2 thirds k z's, you will tend to recover estimators with this kind of dimension dependent sub Gaussian rate. They'll pay trace sigma times log 1 over delta. Whereas we want our tail to be in dimension independent. So this idea, this, this straightforward generalization won't work uh, in high dimensions if you want the optimal kind of rate. Lugosi and Mendelssohn proposed the following way uh, around this. You can't ask, you just can't ask for two thirds of the z's uh, to be inliers. If you try to, where, at least where the definition of inlier is not too far from the mean in L2. If you do, you're going to have to pay too large a distance to the mean. So instead, they propose to change our perspective on the notion of inliers and outliers. Instead of any individual z being an inlier and, or an outlier, full stop, we will talk about inliers and outliers on a direction-dependent basis. We will look at one-dimensional projections of, of the z1 to zk means. Um, and then we will ask, in each direction, which guys are outliers and which guys are not. So here's some manufactured data set with, let's say, population mean here. And you could imagine that if I project this data set uh, onto, um, onto this direction, <laughs> that the points in red form outliers. right? And the points in blue, they're still pretty close to the mean. Whereas if I project in this direction, the set of outliers changed. Now these points in red form outliers. So uh, what does this buy you? Here's the estimator that Lugosi and Mendelssohn propose. Again, they take as input a bunch of samples. They compute these bucketed means z1 to zk. 
And then as output, what they will do is find a vector x, which has minimum maximum distance to a median. Minimize over all the choices of x. The maximum in any direction, here direction always means for me a you know, unit vector in Rd, of the distance from x projected in that direction to the median of the z's in that direction. Is this absolute value? Um, it's not. I think you can put absolute values there, but you can also just think of, of sw swapping u for minus u. Uh, you just might get a different set of outliers. So, OK. So as an alternative interpretation, or maybe the same interpretation, if the maximum value of this uh, optimization problem turns out to be r, I'm using r because it will be our confidence interval radius, then our estimator, mu hat, as a result, will have distance at most r to a median, to being a median in every direction. So um, here's the picture. Here's some, here's some candidate x. Now, I'm not saying this is the best x. This is some candidate x we might be evaluating to see if it's, our, if it's a good estimator. And if I project in this direction, I need to pay this distance to a median. Whereas if I project in this direction, OK, the median changed. This guy is certainly no longer a median in this direction, but this guy is. And I need to pay this distance to a median. So we'll try to minimize, uh, minimize the worst case distance I need to pay to a median over choice of this black dot. OK, this is a bit of a wall of text, but uh, this is really the, the beating heart of Lugosi and Mendelssohn's estimator. So as before, you, bucket the, you take your samples, you put them in buckets, uh, you take the means in each bucket. And then they prove the following results. This is, the, this is the big thing. If you choose r to be a big constant times this sub-Gaussian rate, then with high probability, probability at least 1 minus delta, for every direction, there are most k over 3 outliers according to the population mean. If you pick the population mean as your point, you will see that projecting in every direction, there are not too many outliers. And furthermore, this, this part's an exercise to prove. Um, any two points that have this property. Uh, Shouldn't be yeah. than new dot product with u? Yeah. yeah, sorry. Thank you. That's a typo. Yeah, this should be uh, ziu. Uh, sorry, what did you say? Mu u, yeah. Mu u. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So furthermore, if you have two points x and y, which share this, uh, this property, you know, if you know that for both x and y, this holds. Uh, y u plus r. You can conclude that uh, x minus y, actually, I think this is another typo. It should be 2r. Okay, and you do this by just saying that um, if you look in the direction from x to y, then there must be a shared inlier. Both, both x and y must have an inlier in that direction. You can compare uh, their locations to that inlier. Okay. Unfortunately, so, so now this suggests an obvious estimator, right? Just um, find any point. Uh, yeah. Suppose I told you r, although you could minimize over r. Suppose I find any point. Uh, which in every direction has a small number of outliers. Sounds like it'll work according to this lemma, but how on earth would you do this algorithmically? Right? So the main contribution of, the, of, of my work is um, a convex relaxation uh, and an analysis of it of this optimization problem, which you can see is the one that I just described for this Lugosian Mendelssohn uh, median. Right, so minimize over all choices of x in Rd and all radii r, um, the radius such that for every direction u, there are at most k over 3 z's that form outliers according to x. And the philosophy in the construction of this semi-definite program, which follows this uh, sum of squares method, is that you use an SDP which has enough variables and constraints that every step of Lugosi and Mendelssohn's analysis, every step of their proof of their lemma, also goes through for, to analyze this SDP. 
right? And this is surprising that you can do this. You can imagine that Lugosi and Mendelssohn, if you reinterpret their, their result, you can imagine it's arguing about integral solutions to this optimization problem, right? We'll take a convex relaxation of it, but our relaxation will be sufficiently strong that whatever properties of integral solutions Lugosi and Mendelssohn are using also hold for relaxed solutions, right? And of course, you know, if you add enough constraints, you can always do this. Uh, the non-trivial thing is that you can capture enough properties of the integral solutions using only a polynomial number of extra variables and constraints. So this is kind of this is kind of the core of this proofs to algorithms sum of squares method that Jerry and Adam talked about on uh, on Monday. And the sum of squares framework it gives you some um, some technology to uh, add these add the right constraints in a principled fashion, so you don't have to cook them up all by yourself. Um, setting this SDP up is actually a little bit cumbersome for a talk, so. Um, I'm going to switch to discussing a slightly simpler problem that's going to capture most of, basically all of the main ideas uh, in the STP relaxation of this. So question. Yeah. You have a relaxation. The relaxation isn't tight, but do the bold text, the value of the relaxation is also an acceptable value of R? That's exactly right. Great. Yes. <coughs> yes. The value of the relaxation is acceptable value of R. And, okay, I didn't tell you, but you need to find some way to take a, you know, a solution to the relaxation and actually extract an estimator. This turns out to be trivial. There's no, no interesting rounding. You just read it off of the STP. Um, okay, so if, uh, yeah, other questions about this, because then I'm going to switch to uh, a simpler problem. I have like five, ten minutes, is that right? Cool. Okay, so... Let's um, talk about a simpler problem. I'm going to change notation. I'm going to throw out the samples x. I don't care about them anymore. We're certainly we're going to take them. We're going to bucket them. We're going to use the empirical means in the sam in the buckets. So now let's talk about a random variable z. It has mean mu, and let's say it has covariance sigma. So this is a change of notation from before. And I'm going to be interested in a slightly different problem, which I'm going to call certifying the median. So the problem is the following. I'll give you the vectors z1 to zk. And I will give you R, and I will give you some candidate point X, right, in RD. What I would like you to do is certify, and I'll say what this means in a second, that uh, X doesn't have too many outliers in any direction. Um, what, does, what is certification? This is kind of a, a CS theory concept that I'm not sure has totally made it over to statistics. So here's the idea. I want an algorithm that takes this input and it either outputs yes or I don't know. If the output is I don't know, then you, don't, you didn't learn anything about, your, about, about the inputs. But if the output is yes, then, the then there's a guarantee, probability one, no, pro no probability here. If the output is yes, then there is a guarantee that uh, there are at most k over three outliers in any direction according to x. Right? And the goal is that this certification should succeed, so that is output yes, with high probability over z1 up to zk. If I choose r at this, this turns out to be the right sub-Gaussian rate if you, if you go back through uh, the bucketing and figure out what, how the covariance has changed. Okay, so you can imagine that what's happening is we're saying, let's solve an easier problem. I'll, I'll tell you the mean, right? Now I just want you to check that it, there aren't too many outliers. And even this doesn't have an obvious polynomial time algorithm because you have to check something in every direction of Rd. So just as an example, if I told you this data set, and I told you this point, and I told you this distance r, you would have to output I don't know. Because there are too many, there are too many outliers in this direction as centered by this point. But if I told you the point here, which I didn't make a picture for, you, you could say yes. <clears throat> so let me describe now a semi-definite program. You should say yes. You should, yeah, 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 you should say yes. And we hope that you are able to with high probability. Yeah, that's right. Yes? I'm a bit confused. I can think about a skewed non-symmetrical distribution where close to the median there's nothing. Things are... So the, 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 the first step... With various... The first step will solve this, right? It, it, if you can't just use a median of, of, uh, of x. You have, like, by taking these empirical means in each bucket, you guarantee that the population mean is close to the median. 
that make sense? We can discuss it offline too. Okay. Um, okay, since I don't have too much time, let me describe what this STP looks like and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So, like, like, like uh, every classical STP, it starts with a quadratic <laughs> program. Here's the quadratic program. It has some, uh, some variables that represent a vector in D dimensions, and it has some variables which I'm thinking of as 0, 1, which represent outlierness. Okay? And the goal will be to maximize over all directions and choices of uh, these 0, 1 variables. Well, this just enforces that uh, the variables are 0, 1, and this enforces that you're a unit direction. Maximize over all your 0, 1 choices the number of outliers in this direction, right? If I set bi to 0, then, then this inequality is vacuous. But my goal is to set bi's to 1, because I'm trying to maximize this. And if I set bi to 1, it says that, that zi is an outlier in the in the u direction. Sorry, this should probably be x, because I want this to make sense given any point. And now, like usual, you'll take this quadratic program. You'll think of rank 1 solutions to it, which would have the form concatenation of bu, concatenation of bu transpose. This is like a d plus k dimensional vector. And we'll relax it to some block PSD matrix. So it has a block that represents, that's a proxy for bb transpose, a block that's a proxy for uu transpose, and then off diagonal blocks. And the resulting STP will look like this. Maximize over block matrices like this guy, the trace of this part, that's like my objective function. Um, subject to the constraint that on diagonal in the B block, the values are at most 1. That's capturing this. That's a relaxed version of the 0, 1 constraint. The trace of the U block should be 1. That's a relaxed version of this constraint. And um, if you think of the ith row, wi, as a proxy for bi times u, which is what shows up in this quadratic program constraint, you'll, you'll wind up with these relaxed constraints. So this is the SDP. Um, if there, are there questions about it? Otherwise, I'll say two lines about the analysis and then wrap up. Cool. So what's our, what's our goal? We want to say that in every direction, there are at most k over 3 outliers, assuming I make, I make a good choice for the value r. And we would like for this to happen with high probability. This is critical. This is how I'll get log 1 over delta tail dependence. The proof of this comes in two parts. There's an expectation step and a concentration step. And uh, both of them use non-trivial properties of the, of the STP as compared to more naive, um, more naive kinds of high-dimensional medians. So uh, the first step is to show that the expected value of the STP, the expectation here is over z1 to zk, is at most, let's say, k over 6, some constant less than k <coughs> over 3. Um, and to do this, the proof relates the STP value to a norm of a random matrix. This is a pretty standard way to analyze an STP. Except often one relates the STP value to a familiar, random, a familiar norm like the spectral norm of the covariance of the z's or something like this. In our setting, that won't work because I can't get control over the empirical covariance. I just don't have enough moment control on the z's. And so we're saved in this step by being able to use a more robust norm than one might usually use to analyze a semi-definite program. We can actually use a 2 to 1 norm of a random matrix. And then we use growth index inequality to relate the STP value to the 2 to 1 norm. So we can, I'm happy to discuss this offline. Then there's a concentration step, which, which I think actually is maybe the more, it's the simpler, but maybe the more interesting um, part of the proof. Um, our goal is to show that the STP concentrates around its expected value with, with really nice concentration, exponential tails. Um, and the, the reason this holds is because the STP picks up on the fact that moving a single zi as far as you like can only introduce one more outlier. Okay? This, is a, this is a property that the STP has which would not be shared by norms or averages of the z's, which, would be, which wouldn't satisfy a bounded differences property. But we can show that the, that the STP value satisfies a, a bounded differences property, and therefore we get exponential concentration about its expectation. So this is kind of a recap of what I just said. Um, a common strategy to analyze semi-definite programs is to, uh, especially in this kind of estimation settings, is to control their values by using eigenvalues of nice random matrices, uh, matrices formed from your inputs, <laughs> from your samples. Unfortunately, the most standard kind of things to do won't work because you can't control even the top eigenvalue of the covariance, of so the empirical covariance. 
But the SDP can handle less outlier sensitive norms. By growth and deke inequalities, the SDP can handle uh, norms that only look at, say, the first moment of disease instead of the second. And the second part, point is that unlike norms, averages, and other kind of analytic quantities, uh, the SD, SDP values can satisfy bounded differences. Uh, and that's, this, this means that SDPs can offer you high probability uh, guarantees in settings where averages like empirical mean would not. So the, in conclusion, the main theorem is the first polynomial time estimator that achieves sub-Gaussian rates in the heavy-tailed setting um, in high dimensions. And uh, this goes back to Andrea's question uh, and uh, another question from earlier in the talk. The algorithm I described is most certainly not practical. It, is, it answers the question, is there a polynomial time algorithm for this problem? But it doesn't go beyond that. Um, so you might first ask whether this algorithm can be made practical. And the next question you might ask is because of the subtle, you know, there's not that much difference uh, for reasonable values of delta, you might think, in the tail rates of this estimator versus the slightly less good ones that are dimension dependent. There's a, there's a question of whether you can find a practical estimator with empirical performance that outperforms the dimension dependent estimators, which are really fast in practice, like geometric median. OK, that's all. Thanks very much for your attention. Questions? Um, <coughs> do the random matrices involved in the analysis for the original problem, the meet the estimating the mean, uh, are they still nice? Like, do they have like horribly dependent entries and et cetera? No, 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 no. I mean, the, it, the, the only thing you actually need to do, if I'd had 10 more minutes, I could show you the analysis of the whole thing. Um, you really just show that the SDP value, SDDP, of Z1 to uh, ZK, you bound this in terms of the 2 to 1 norm of the matrix whose rows are the samples, are the means, are the bucketed means. So the 2 to 2 norm of this matrix would be the top, top eigenvalue uh, of the empirical covariance, or the square root of it, I guess. So this is for the easier problem that you chose to discuss instead of the original problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No different. No different. Okay. It, it, that's, this is all you need to also to analyze, also for the original problem. Other questions? So perhaps I have one question. Mm -hmm. So can you explain briefly why you said that uh, you have to use uh, SOS4 for the original problem? Yeah. Can you explain briefly where, where Good. Comes? Good question. Um, I should say I don't know that you have to. Uh, there, it's what you do. It's what it's what happens. Um, kind of for tech. At some point, you just say, "Well, throw in as many constraints as I feel like I need today." So what is but uh, yeah, the, the the only reason is that um, if you want. So here I've, I'm thinking about the problem where I was told mu, right? Uh, if instead you're also searching over x's, uh, you, you just got a degree three polynomial here. So. You know, if you want to use the SOS framework, you need to throw and get to degree four just so you have a well-defined relaxation. I think you can probably avoid most of the degree four SDP. Other questions? Where uh, um, in SDP is the uh, two by three? You know, that uh, you wanted two thirds of the ZIs to be good. Oh, two can thirds. Uh, two thirds is just a number bigger than half. Uh, all, what will turn out to matter is that, um, like, so you can show that that, uh, that 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 for this part of it, you can show any kind of any quantile is good. That doesn't matter. You just kind of lose in losing the constant in front of the rate. You need the quantile to be bigger than half because you want to say that eventually the guy that I find and the ground truth mean have a shared inlier in the direction between them. Right, so you look at the direction between them. You say, here's my guy. Here's here's the mean, and there's some z which is not too far. Uh, you know, it sits, lies between them in this projection, right? So that I can I can get a handle on how far I was from the mean. So then, okay. okay yeah, uh, it's a matter can be extended to estimate uh, covariance matrix and the norm with bounded first moment like a sharp uh, with sharp type concentration. That's a good question. Uh, I believe that it can. Um, we actually haven't haven't finished proving that. Uh, we've thought about it, but. I don't, uh, I don't know the answer yet. All right. So let's thank Sam again. Yeah. Uh, 11,
Hello, I'm 30. <coughs>